Um, good evening, everybody. Um, yeah, so my name is Tristan. I'm from Pizza Hut Digital Ventures. Um, I'm going to give you pretty much a summary of what Pizza Hut Digital Ventures is and how Pizza Hut, which is a company that you're all probably very familiar with, having now eaten some, that um, <coughs> the, the journey that Pizza Hut's been on to, to enter the e-commerce space and to basically round off its efforts in, in e-commerce and as well, my role in analytics and, and the way that I work with the various teams within PhDV to drive that e-commerce um, strategy that we have. All right. Um, so first of all, I just want to give you a good summary of what Pizza Hut Digital Ventures is, because some of you might, might not be familiar with this recent trend towards digital ventures that lots of legacy companies are undertaking. Um, KFC, it's actually another partner of Yum, is also kicking off a digital ventures enterprise. And I think that there are lots of, um, I don't have any examples off the top of my head, but other legacy businesses that um, have been around for decades, Pizza Hut's from the 50s, that never had a very strong or consolidated um, e-commerce strategy that are now kicking off um, digital ventures um, of their own. So PHDV is a tech company. Um, owned wholly by Pizza Hut International and is run independently. Um, it was set up initially in the UK um, to run the UK and France markets and has now expanded into, so the tech, the tech teams have now expanded into Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam and Dallas in the United States. So the Vietnam team looks after the expansion of digital ventures um, in the Asian markets. So when I say markets, I just mean the countries that have Pizza Hut. And the United States office in Dallas looks after the Latin American markets. So Pizza Hut International is all countries in the world that have Pizza Hut, with the exception of the United States and China. At the moment, I think that's about 108 countries. There are a couple of countries in Africa that have only one or two stores. Um, and th they're growing at the moment. So I'm not exactly certain what that number is. So I apologize for not having that accurately. Pizza Hut International uh, is a $1 billion company. Uh, for comparison's sake, the United States on its own is a $1 billion company. So Pizza Hut in the US is equal to the Pizza Hut in the entire rest of the world. So you can understand the need for yum foods to split the two um, down the middle. And Americans seem to like Pizza Hut a lot. So. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so until recently, Pizza Hut has not had a uniformed approach to um, its websites or e-commerce. Um, it's instead largely left the operation of e-commerce platforms and websites to the individual markets in which it operates. Um, there's a story that gets brought out quite frequently at, um, at uh, meetings with the senior leadership team that once upon a time there was a, a conference room where all the leaders of the different countries are in the room and, and said, I think the internet's going to be quite a big thing. Should we do something about it? And then one or two people in the room put their hands up and said, yeah, my children are pretty good in building websites, let's get them to do it. And, and that's actually a pretty true um, retelling of what happened. So each of the different markets went off and built their own um, websites initially. They weren't e-commerce platforms, they were just basically menus online. Uh, and, we, and then fast forward 20, 30 years to where we are now and we have a situation whereby across the world, very different to other uh, franchise model uh, food companies, you have a different website and a different user experience in every single market that we operate in. And that is not a great place to be from a digital, a digital branding standpoint, as you can imagine. Um, this is a really sad sight to see, considering that Pizza Hut has uh, the claim of being the world's first purchase online. A large pizza in, back in California in 1994 is said to be the world's first e-commerce uh, purchase. Too bad uh, they didn't, um, you know, keep up the uh, energy there. <laughs> in the UK, Pizza Hut is split into two different businesses. So the delivery business, which we've just all experienced, hopefully, and the restaurant business. So many of you, um, people often retell stories of when they were young. Uh, their first experience of Pizza Hut is going into the dining restaurant, sitting down and having a... Um, a uh, the salad bar and the, the dessert bar and, and the pizzas and everything. And I think for many people that's a very fond me memory. Unfortunately today those are largely gone and the dine-in restaurant business is, is shrinking. Therefore, to, to stay relevant and to stay alive, Pizza Hut has had to pivot towards a delivery business. Now this is quite interesting to a lot of people when I say this because a lot of people are not actually aware that Pizza Hut is a delivery business because of those memories they have of um, the dine-in situation. And Domino's has just 
for lack of a better word, dominated in the delivery uh, <laughs> space. Um, yeah, so what I'm talking about today is going to be largely focused on the delivery side of the business. So the website that we, we built and that we manage in the UK and all the markets I'm going to talk about is primarily delivery only. So essentially, that business is contracting and the delivery space and the collection as well, so you can actually go on site and order to pick up, is, is growing and quite remarkably as well. Um, <coughs> Okay, so PHDV exists to bring about a consolidated user experience and brand experience throughout all the markets that it operates in. So the UK is the largest market within Pizza Hut International. It equates to about one-fifth of um, that billion dollars that I mentioned earlier. And then we have other markets that are, that are, that are quite large. Japan, Malaysia, France, excuse me, Hong Kong, um, Australia, Canada. So those are the markets that we primar that we've initially focused on um, growing our uh, e-commerce capabilities to. Um, yeah. So essentially, when I say Pizza Hut Digital Ventures or PHDV, I'm talking about a user experience um, standard that we are trying to apply to each of the various markets that we operate in. Now there are three ways that Pizza Hut um, Digital Ventures approaches this. We have the first one, which is a centralized um, tech stack and build. Essentially, that means that our team build the stack in whichever market, uh, sorry, build the stack in, in this market, and then we roll it out to each of the markets one by one as we go. We own the tech, we own everything. It's pretty much a white label. Turn it on for the new country, add up, put their menu online, and, and you're good to go. The second strategy for smaller markets is the hybrid strategy. So this is basically UX brand standard that we that those countries that are more sophisticated have the ability and the IT and tech teams to build a Pizza Hut Digital Ventures website that looks and feels like ours, but the back end is their own, and we have very little to do with with that side of things. Our job in that regard is just to make sure that they follow the standard, that and and to help them with areas that they're not so au fait with in e-commerce, analytics, UX, um, and product. Another, thing, another area we really help them with is in op the optimization journeys that they go on. What can they test? Helping them ideate on tests, working with them to um, become better, having a better testing mindset. And the third one, and our, certainly our least favorite, is the local vendor strategy. Basically, this is where we send out a bunch of specifications to the, the vendor that that country um, works with already and tells them to bring their site up to the standard of Pizza Hut International and follow these guidelines. So um, this strategy is one that we're actually trying to eliminate. Um, it's a bit, it, it, it creates a lot of problems. It's very expensive for the markets that we work in. There are no, um, there's not a lot of confidence in Pizza Hut International for the markets that um, choose to go down a vendor route. And it often ends up being a lot more expensive than it needs to be than doing it in-house. Um, they tend to be the smaller local markets, though. So that's one, one reason why it's probably still um, kicking around. But um, that's something that we're trying to um, uh, resolve. So um, I just wanted to break the ice a little bit with a little video here. Um, does anyone know what Dealbot is? Have been on Pizza Hut's website and ordered a pizza and come across Dealbot? OK. Great. So I won't be. T I would, you would learn all learn something new. Uh, Dealbot is a is a um, a feature that you can toggle onto the Pizza Hut website that allows you to. And I'm not selling. To um, <laughs> to it, it basically as you peruse the menu and add items to your basket, it it runs an algorithm in the background that offers up um, either aligns it with existing deals, so it um, tells you how much you've saved, or it encourages you to to purchase certain things um, that. Uh, would save you money because they're in combination. So I'll just play this video quickly if that's... Yeah. So that's just a cool video that was put together by our really talented, um, one of our really talented designers. And I'm going to talk about Dealbot later on, so I just wanted to introduce you to the concept. Um, all right. So um, basically... Oh, don't play again. <laughs> all right. Um, so Pizza Hut in the UK, for example, works very closely with the, um, so, sorry, PHTV, who I work for, works very closely with the UK business. So the UK business is the, you know, the operations, the stores that you see on the high street, um, the deliveries, the drivers that, that, that deliver your pizza, um, the whole supply chain, and also um, 
it's a marketing agency. So essentially, that's what it does. It's a master franchisee that owns all the stores or some of the stores and works with other franchisees to market Pizza Hut and deliver on operations. What they do not do or cannot do, perhaps, is e-commerce. So they have no history in that and, and that's where PHDV comes in. So this is more or less the situation that you see in all of the markets in which Pizza Hut operates. And um, therefore, Pizza Hut Digital Ventures is kind of a knowledge base or a nerve center for, for online uh, e-commerce insights for each of those markets. Um, our analytics team in London, which is actually the whole analytics team for the world, is two people. So um, we are severely understaffed in that regard. Um, so we have to do things very quickly and, um, and, and be very clear about what, what we're measuring um, and make decisions and recommendations very um, firmly. Uh, yep. So, oops, that was supposed to be the slide that you were seeing, but I'm looking at the apologies. <laughs> um, yeah, so for us, the one metric that matters uh, is conversion. So while it's very important for us to keep an eye on order values and um, overall revenues, we choose conversion as the, as the uh, measure of, of success online, and all of our decisions are made in the um, guise of conversion. So did customers come to the site, and if they did, did they buy something? The marketing agency that is Pizza Hut UK or whatever country you're in is responsible for driving that traffic to the site. But once it gets there, it becomes our responsibility. So whatever journey or experience or tests we expose them to while they're on the site is 100% down to us. We, um, we work very closely, as I mentioned, with other markets to provide them feedback on how that is going and how their, um, their uh, conversion is performing. But at times, some of the markets will um, take steps without our knowledge, and it's their business so they're allowed to, that severely undermine um, conversion performance simply because they're not up to, they've not been in the, um, you know, the e-commerce way of thinking. One example recently was in Hong Kong, which is a market we've recently launched to our uh, UX brand standard, the second one on the list, whereby they uh, linked, they, they put out a very large um, advertising campaign online that linked them to the old site, which was still live for some reason somewhere, and suddenly conversion for that traffic source tanked to 0%, and they didn't look at that, and they didn't realize. So you can imagine two people who are looking after every single country in the world that's on DV have to come across that. We have to act very quickly to, to rectify that and get in touch with the markets and improve, um, and, and notify them of those issues and, and improve them. Um, so internally as well, it's not just all external feedback. We look very closely at the, um, at the uh, funnel and conversion and friction points within the funnel. We look for opportunities daily to test and to inform the business on how things are going. Um, um, we will feed up friction points to our product and engineering teams to look into it a moment, um, as, soon as, as soon as they become available to us. But um, just going back to the DealBot example that I talked about, um, so DealBot, as I mentioned, is a, um, a, an algorithm that searches for deals and offers up the best value to customers um, as they go through the system. But as you'll have seen in the video, there is an opportunity for you to accept or dismiss the DealBot modal. Now, our analysis has told us that people who do accept the DealBot, people accept the DealBot modal more often than they do not. And for people who have accepted the DealBot modal, um, they convert more frequently and they have a higher order value. So, at, However, this is a friction point in the journey. It comes up right after you select your hut. So the question often comes to us is, why do we have this friction point in the journey that, that, that could um, effectively deter customers, especially when the metrics say that for people who accept it, the, journey, the, out, the business metrics outcomes are better. It turns out that um, we, did, we ran a few tests and by, turning the, by switching DealBot on for everybody without their knowledge um, actually had a negative impact because people weren't aware of why they were receiving savings. And so they would go through the journey and see discounts being applied to their inbox but not actually be able to work out how or why and it became a very jarring experience. So while ultimately we would look for opportunities to remove friction points from the journey, that is one good example, in my opinion, of why 
uh, it's a suitable one to have. Um, sorry, I've talked through these things and yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, like I said, we, we in the analytics team at DV um, review the tech stack, uh, uh, the well, the performance on the site, and let the the uh, engineers understand whenever there's an issue with the tech stack, so that they can look into it. Um, and we are constantly looking for op opportunities for testing and optimization, optimizing on the user experience. Um, I just want to talk as well a, a bit about of an initiative that uh, my team has, my team and the UX team have recently kicked off. It's called the PhD for Performance Lab. This is an opportunity for myself, uh, the, UX, uh, the UX team in, in PhDV and a lot of the other markets to come together and share learnings from each of the different um, websites that we operate and um, basically to understand what worked in one market and, and, and appreciate whether or not that might apply to another market and um, work in tandem. So we have frequently have um, sessions online to discuss conferencing, bring lots of stakeholders in to discuss um, areas for opportunities for, um, oh sorry, no, yeah, opportunities for ideation on optimizations and um, ways to encourage each other and, and testing ideas that we can um, that we can move forward with. Not all learnings at a particular site are applicable across all markets. It, um, it's a, the UK site does quite a lot of optimizations, but you can't simply cut and paste one uh, feature that you've applied in a particular market to another market because of local nuances and, and things like that. So it, while, while it's efficient to, um, to roll out a test in one market and then say to the other markets, hey, we did this, you should try it, we simply don't do that. We we share the idea. We encourage the team to test it, and if it works for them, they should adopt it. If not, move on to the next test. Yep. So as I mentioned, we work very close across um, together with the UX and product teams. So we frequently um, establish working groups uh, to, to almost on a weekly basis to review the the funnel and constantly looking for new new opportunities to address friction, drop off, and um, opportunities for testing. Uh, we often, if we come across a problem, we will often attack uh, a, a problem or an opportunity. UX and analytics will attack that problem or opportunity from different directions and then we will come together at the end of the process to see if there is um, some correlation in what we found and if so, what can we do about that. Um, I want to give you a few examples of some of the experiments that we've run at PHDV on the UK website. So we found this problem whereby, um, cust we, well, there's always a problem on e-commerce websites where customers are dropping off having added something to basket. It's called abandoned basket. So uh, we wanted to understand through a da data capture exercise how far the customers were away from the minimum spend required to be eligible for delivery. Because if you're not, you, you simply can't um, order your pizza if you've not met the minimum threshold for delivery. So we, were, so we set up an exercise where we captured um, quite a few sessions data to see where and how far from the minimum spend customers were dropping off. <coughs> In this example here, um, you can see that the minimum order delivery is £11.99. That's pretty average across um, Pizza Hut, although it does range from about £9.99 up to about £17 minimum spend. So we wanted to understand if there was some kind of rhyme or reason to why and how people were dropping off. It affected about 6% of, once this model went live, it affected about 6% of sessions. Um, and half of that group were within three pounds of the minimum spend. Of that group, 50% after this model went live, 50% still continued to abandon basket. So what else could we do? The next option was to notify them of how far they were away from their minimum spend so that they could start thinking about um, going back into the menu and looking for items that would get them over the line. The other option was to um, offer them up products that were around the three pound mark. Uh, yeah, so there's one, 163 for the drink and 350 for the wings to see if we could get them over the line that way rather than losing them entirely. Um, we, we had a statistically significant outcome for both of these modals versus the control, which was simply telling them that they had not made the minimum spend. 
and we found that um, we had a higher conversion rate for the second variant, which is this one here. So the people who were exposed to this model were more likely to go on and purchase something, but the order values for people who saw the first model, which simply told them how far they were away from minimum spend, they would go back into the menu and obviously buy something of greater value, which is perhaps a better outcome. But then, of course, you have to make sure that you're not losing transactions um, by having a lower conversion rate. Um, there is another test I'll explain to you. This is a very, very simple A-B test that we ran. Um, we, there are lots of deals on the website, obviously, as you'd be aware. Um, and those deals are combinations of different products all bundled together. So what customers are not necessarily aware of is if they were to go and buy each of those products a la carte, what would be the total sum and how much are they saving by purchasing a deal? Some people think that, that sometimes deals are not necessarily better value than buying things um, a la carte. What we've done with this example um, is probably a bit of a cheeky example because we've, in the red box in the variant down the bottom, you can see a, um, a, a pound value that's been crossed out. That value would actually be the equivalent spend for that deal were you to buy all the most expensive items that were available on the menu. So <laughs> essentially we're telling the customer that theoretically you're saving uh, 22 pounds 17 if you were to go and buy like the Rolls Royce of pizzas. Um, when we so we ran an A-B test here, control and variant, and we found that um, the, the, there was a dramatic increase in, in um, conversion when customers were made aware of how much they were potentially saving um, by exposing the deal savings to them. Um, about 0.3 of a percent and on a website that gets near a million sessions a week, that's that's pretty significant um, positive outcome. Cool. Um, I'm probably getting close to running out of time, so I will just uh, head towards um, a summary. Uh, Pizza Hut is a well-known and much-loved brand that is facing many challenges coming from within the tech space. So there are lots of aggregators and things like that that are affecting Pizza Hut and other companies such as Domino's. Um, so Entering into the tech space uh, is almost an essential move for Pizza Hut if they are to survive. Um, so in order to compete and remain relevant into the future, Pizza Hut around the world will need to create and maintain powerful e-commerce solutions that delight the customer. And, and e from our view, uh, our opinion, a centralized e-commerce strategy is an effective way to establish a consistent online brand. However, this needs to be customizable for local markets, not just copy and paste.